my name is Mrs. Matthew. Just so you know, I'm quoting my mom here. That's not my name. This is something my mom said to us one time when my brother um, all of a sudden started dating this young lady and he brought her to the house. And this young lady walks in and we had known her. We'd gone to church with her. We'd known her for a long time. And she looks at my mom, just so you know, my, my parents' names are Sunny and Valsa, not Honey and Salsa, just so you know, all right? My mom's name is Valsa. And so this young lady, who my brother is now dating, comes in through the front door, says hi to me. Hey, Ben, how you doing? Hey, hey, how you And she looks at my mom and she says, hey, Valsa. Exactly. Some of you felt that, right? And well, they go on on their business, and my mom, she gets this little scowl on her face, and she looks at me and she says, but my name is Mrs. Matthew. You see, in our house, I mean, I think in most houses, when there's a generational difference, you, you, you refer to that other generation, that older generation, with a, a level of respect, a level of honor, right? Have you ever seen these little memes that are going around, those videos, those TikTok videos where high schoolers are going around the high school to their teachers and calling their teachers by their first names. Hello, Fred. And Fred looks and is like, I'm going to take you down right now, right? <laughs> because these teachers realize, no, 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 no. You are a student. I am a teacher. And there should be some respect in our house, even if there was a generational difference, if it was even within the Indian community that we're in, we always refer to them as uncle or aunt, even if there wasn't a familial blood relation, there was always this level of respect that was expected. Even with my own kids, with our neighbors, we always tell them, don't call him Tom, call him Mr. Tom, right? That was one of the rules of our household, and I think for many households as well, is that we want to encourage generational respect. We want to encourage that people understand it's not just buddies, yeah, her name's Valsa, but she should have called her Mrs. Matthew. Well, interesting enough, we have a passage here, as the whole pastoral epistles is about some rules in the family, the family of God, how we should be treating each other, whether it be as brothers and sisters, or even sometimes those that are in leadership. Paul is writing these things, as he says in this verse, that you may know how you ought to behave in the household of God. He wants us to have some kind of common rules of what it looks like to be in the family of faith. And this whole series, and specifically in 1 Timothy, is trying to help us, as we're titling this whole series, to be gospel-shaped, that we want the gospel of Jesus Christ to form us. To, to challenge us and to encourage us on how to live life in a family that has brought us together through the gospel. And we're now finishing this section, particularly in chapter 5, as it relates to gospel-shaped church, church life in specific. In this section that we're getting into, 1 Timothy chapter 5, the, the second half, and it has a little couple of verses in chapter 6, are really about some relationships that we in the church may have, whether it's between saints and elders, or whether it be between servants and masters. These relationships is trying to, to help us. Paul, through Timothy, is trying to help us in how we respond and show respect and honor to those that lead and serve, whether they lead and serve in the context of the local church or whether they lead and serve in your places of employment. The encouragement for all of us is that if we want to be a gospel shaped church, this church serves those that lead so those that lead can serve. This is the main idea that Paul wants to get across here that whatever those relationships are, those, those elders that you have in your church, or whether it be those bosses that you have at your work, we want you to honor them, to serve them so that they can serve as well. And can I be very honest with you? I mean, I hope I'm always honest with you, but that much more this morning, can I tell you that this passage is a little, shall we say, awkward for me to preach to you? 
This is a passage about how you should honor the elders, and I'm one of the elders. This is like you parents maybe going to your kids at night and say, hey, I'd like to read to you a passage in the book of Ephesians. It says here, honor your mother and father. Isn't that a great passage, son? Daughter, don't you think this is a wonderful Bible? It's, it's kind of self-serving, it feels a little, right? And I kind of feel awkward this morning preaching a message to you about how you should honor elders when I am one of the elders. So maybe I should have Juan and Sean come up here. As, no, I'm not going to do that, but... I want to admit to you, it feels a little awkward, but this is God's word. We need to be encouraged, maybe even challenged by how we all, including myself, because yes, while I am one of the elders, I am still under the elders. I'm still under their submission as well. So I hope you understand this really is for all of us. I hope it doesn't come across as self-serving in that sense. And so he gets right into it. As he starts talking first to the saints all of us that call ourselves Christians as part of this family of God and how we are to relate to the elders. Look what he says in verse 17. Let the elders who rue well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And this is a continuation of what Paul has already started earlier in the chapter. He's already talked about how we should treat elderly people in our church, those older men, those older women, those women who may be widows. Sean just talked about that last week. And this is kind of a continuation of that. But instead of just talking about older men and older women by age, Paul is now speaking of elders, plural specifically in relation to those that have been tasked to serve and lead the local church. What the New Testament calls elders or pastors. Some translations even use the word overseer or bishop. Try that later today. Call out Bishop Juan or Bishop Sean, right? Because the word bishop really just means an overseer, one who watches over the church. The overwhelming evidence of the early church in the book of Acts is that elders, in the plural, was the normative and expected leadership for the local church. Not a one-man system, but a plurality of men that are called to care and teach and pray and shepherd the church of God. And Paul doesn't commend these men to leadership just because they're elder, like they're older, or as my kids say to me, Dad, you know you're a little old. You were born in the 1900s. And I'm like, oh, let's read Ephesians 5, shall we? Yes, I, I am probably older than some, but the qualification is not just because of what it says on your birth certificate. It's because of what Paul said earlier in chapter 3. Remember that? The qualifications of an elder is what qualifies them to be An elder, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, hospitable, respectable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well. He must not be a recent convert. He must not be puffed up. He must be well thought of by outsiders. If you want to see if an elder is ruling well, look at the qualifications of an elder. And Paul encouraged Timothy to ensure that if they are ruling well, that's what the text says, if they are ruling well, that care should be given to them, just like he said earlier about those widows. He wants to encourage Timothy to make sure that those who care are cared for. The honor here is similar to the honor Paul expects In so many other places, we'll see in chapter 6, honor due to masters. Or in chapter 6, verse 6, honor due to God. Or he'll say later in 2 Timothy 2, how we can be households of vessels dedicated to honor. But Paul goes further than just to say, you should show them respect, which you should. He goes further than just saying you should show them admiration, which you should. You should say thanks to your elders. And. He actually goes a step further. He says, while you should show them honor, you should also honor them in another way. Look what the text says. It says, double honor. And this double honor is monetary. It's financial. 
It's practical. This is honor and honorarium. This is celebration and cash. This is respect and remuneration. This is praise and payment. This is dignity and dinero. I have a whole bunch of them here, just so you know, all right? (laughs) This is a pat on the back and, yeah, payment in the pocket. It's both and. And let's be clear here. So we have too many examples throughout the history of the church of those ministers, pastors, men who have been called to be in the leadership of a church that have abused their position for financial gain. You've heard of these guys, right? Uh, God has called you to help me get a new jet this month. Really? I haven't heard that calling from God, but there are people in our culture today that abuse their leadership for monetary gain. That's not what this passage is about, and we know that's clearly an abuse. But don't let the abuses of those people stop you from following the commands and encouragements of Scripture. To be honest, shepherding the flock of God is awesome, hard, rewarding, and difficult work. It's late nights and long visits. It's putting out fires and strengthening ministries. It's often work that's done unseen, unnoticed, and unrecognized. And I want to be very clear, we elders love it. We are so blessed to serve this church. And what Paul is trying to do here is he wants the church to recognize those that do the difficult work of being elders. And two, he wants the church to show their appreciation in real and tangible ways. Let's be clear, elders don't become elders for the money. But they shouldn't have to do it without money. That's the encouragement of this passage. And so Paul, he engages with Scripture two times, starting in verse 18. As Scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Paul cites two texts, one in the Old Testament and one of Jesus himself. And trying to build up this argument, common farm wisdom, as he says, that, you know those ox, right, that go on the threshing and they help separate the grain from the chaff. You know what that ox does sometimes as it's turning around? Sometimes it steps down and it eats a little bit of that grain. Could you imagine a farmer seeing that ox do that? Stupid ox, stop stealing my food! I don't know why he has that accent all of a sudden, but imagine he does that, right? That'd be silly for a farmer to get angry at the ox for eating the food because it's using the food to do the work for the farmer. That's what Paul is saying here. And it's so interesting. The way that he actually quotes it, he doesn't do a direct quote from Deuteronomy 25. Deuteronomy 25 says, you shall not muzzle a threshing ox. He actually changes a little bit of the order. He says, a threshing ox, you shall not muzzle. He's trying to put the emphasis on what the ox does and who the ox is. Don't start calling me Ox Ben, all right? But he's trying to highlight here, these guys are doing hard work. And if an elder is doing hard work in the church, caring for the people of God, maybe not separating grain from chaff, but maybe separating true and false teaching, but perhaps there should be given some encouragement, both in word and in finance. It should be done with openness and transparency, to be sure, but it should be done nevertheless. To be very honest with you, this is how we do it here at ACC. We do this in two ways. One, we have someone that we have hired on a full-time basis. Sean McDonald is our administrative elder. Sean has had a number of different jobs here. I mean, he used to work at Emmaus Worldwide. He used to have his own photography business. He even used to fix Harley Davidson's. Did you know that? He's a hog, right? Yeah. But the leadership here, 
And, and, and in conjunction with Sean and his family, we, 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 we prayed and we thought, you know what? He has such great gifts and great abilities. We want to serve this church well by hiring him in a full-time capacity. So we pay him a full wage to serve this church. The other way we do that is when individuals, when men come here to preach like this, we also give them what we call an honorarium, about 250 bucks every single time someone preaches from this. And the intent, again, is not for the money, but we want to highlight how much we appreciate those who minister. Someone asked me this, this the other day, how, how much time do I put in to preparing a message between the study and, and, and the notes and the PowerPoint and all that? On average, it's about a part-time job for me. I put in about 15 to 20 hours a week, and I love it. I don't do it for the money, but can I tell you that money helps? Because that's 20 hours that I'm putting into God's word to help the body of Christ. I don't do it for the money. But the money is a wonderful way this church encourages me as I try to preach the word of God. Paul wants it to be very practical. But he also wants there to be not just honor and honor and honor. Look what he says in verse 19. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. And he goes on that much more to encourage them. Verse 20, but those who persist in sin rebuke them in the presence of of all. Paul is now giving some practical advice here in terms of what you should not do no to private charge, and what you should do, yes, to public rebuke when it comes to elders. On the first level, he's saying, listen, if you've got a beef with the elders, if you've got an accusation, the encouragement, the challenge, the command of Scripture is do not do it by yourself. He's not saying you can't bring an accusation. What he's saying is don't do it by yourself. If you've got a, an, a challenge, if you've got a complaint, and let me tell you, in the years that I have been blessed to be an elder, I have had my share of concerns and criticisms and complaints leveled against us. The music is too loud. The music is not loud enough. The preaching is too topical. The preaching is not topical enough. We should have a longer meeting. We should have a shorter meeting. We should meet downtown. We should meet in the suburbs. We should have more meals. We should have less meals. We should have more children's ministry. We should have less children's ministry. We should be doing more conferences. We should not be doing any conferences. We should have flowers for Mother's Day. We shouldn't have any flowers for Mother's Day. We have dealt with it all. And we are so glad that you are willing to bring your concerns to us. Please hear us. We are not saying you can't bring those. But sometimes those concerns turn into accusations against the character of an elder. Do you know what I mean? It's not just, oh, you don't care about my thoughts about music? Well, you must not care about the health of the church. Oh, you don't agree with me about children's ministry? Well, obviously, you don't love our kids. Oh, you don't agree about how we should do outreach? Well, obviously, you then don't love our community. Do you see how it goes from the concern to an accusation of the character? Paul wants you to be careful when you do that. And if you do have a concern, not just about an issue in the church, but the character of an elder, check with somebody else before you bring that to the elders. You know why? Because maybe you're by yourself in this. Maybe you're the only one who thinks it. But if there are others, as he says, as he quotes from both Deuteronomy and again from our Lord himself, he's arguing if two or three are in agreement, then you can bring it. Because community has a way of checking your accusation. Community has a way of checking the accuracy of your accusation. But he doesn't want to give the impression that elders are perfect. Far from it. Because in verse 20, look what he says. He's very clear in saying those that persist in sin, namely there are some elders within the church that clearly are continuing in sin. It's no longer an accusation. It's clearly a sin. Look what he says. Rebuke them in the presence of all. Whoa. Talk about one extreme to the other. 
If you're by yourself, don't bring a charge on their accusation. But if they are clearly singing, bring them in front of everyone. And I've heard some people say, that just seems so unloving. That seems so shameful. That seems so, so drastic. And the point is, yeah. But it's actually the most loving thing you can do. This is what Paul did. Paul, we have an example of Paul doing this in the book of Galatians. When Peter, do you remember the story of Peter where he's eating with some Gentiles and a bunch of Jewish people walk in and Peter's like, ooh, I can't eat with you guys anymore. I'm going to go eat with my Jewish brothers, right? And when Paul finds about how he, his actions were not in keeping with the gospel, it was not about who he was eating with. It was how he was letting the gospel be perverted. If you read the text in Galatians, it says very clearly that Paul confronted Peter publicly, in front of everyone, because he wanted everyone to learn. And this is literally what he says in the text, verse 20, so that the rest may stand in fear. Because being an elder, being in leadership has repercussions, both for good and for bad. The ripple effect of consequence is significant. And everyone needs to understand that if an elder clearly has been sinning. A number of years ago, I had a chance to be in West Africa. And we were in this little community that we shared with baboons. Like, I mean, wild baboons. Probably like from here to that speaker, we'd be eating our meal. And there's like a bunch of baboons who were like, what's up, man? You know, like just hanging out together. And I remember one of the guys that lived in this village says, don't worry, the baboons don't bother you because we've actually told them, we, we, we've helped them understand how not to bother the humans. Apparently a couple of months ago, one of the baboons broke into one of the little huts that we were staying in, stole some of the food and things like that. So the groundskeeper of this little village, he caught one of the baboons, killed it, and put it on a pike in the middle of a village. Ugh. PETA would not be happy with that, Right? This dead baboon in the middle of this entire community. And you know what? It worked. All those other baboons were like, did you see what happened to Fred? Oh man, I ain't going to any of those huts, right? Please do not publicly crucify your elders if they sin. That is not what I'm trying to teach here. But I do want to be clear that if there is an elder who is caught in sin, it should be made public so others learn don't do that. Because it's that serious. It's that important that church leaders who are sinning are held to account to help them, to lovingly bring them to repentance and to teach the church this is serious. And Paul finishes this section by giving some encouragement specifically to Timothy. In the charge of Jesus Christ of God and the elect angels. He wants him to not be prejudiced in living out these rules. Verse 22, he doesn't want him to be hasty on laying on hands. The, the reality that you may need to bring in other men to be leaders, but don't do it too quickly. Just because you have a need, that's not the main reason you should bring on more leaders. The main reason you should bring on more leaders is because of the quality of their character to help lead the church. There's always a need to recognize other men in leadership, but it's never appropriate to appoint new men to leadership without considering their character. And then he gets into this interesting verse in 23, no longer drink water, but use a little wine. And you're like, ooh, what's that about, right? I think this is just part of this encouragement to Timothy. Can I say, as an elder who has had the privilege and joy of serving this church, sometimes we get into issues that make my stomach go, ugh. You ever heard expressions like that? It's enough to give you a stomach ache. It's enough to cause ulcers. <laughs> you know the spiritual care of a church can have some real physiological effects. And I think what Paul is saying to Timothy here is when you're so involved in the spiritual care of the church, you may need to take care of your physical self as what? We're holistic beings. Therefore, take care of both. And he ends in verses 24 and 25 by saying, the sins of some are conspicuous, others come later, 
as much as in verse 25, the good works are seen. And I think what he's trying to end here is by saying, Timothy, do the best you can, but know this, you're not going to be able to catch everything. (laughs) You can't get everything. There are some that are going to sin, and you may be able to deal with it. You may not be able to. There are some that do good works, and hopefully you can encourage, but you may not be able to always do it. Timothy, do the best with what you got. When I started early in my private practice as a therapist, I remember I was so excited to help people as they were struggling with their issues. And when they would grow, when they would make good decisions in therapy, I'd be like, I am awesome! I'm such an amazing therapist. Or the other way, when they would make bad decisions, I'm the worst therapist ever, I give up. And I had a friend of mine who said, Ben, Don't take credit for the good you see in other people, and don't take blame for the bad you see in other people. Be a relentless presenter of God's truth. That's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Don't take credit for the good you see when other people grow, and don't take blame for for other people when you see them do bad. Do the best you can with what God has given you, and be encouraged that God doesn't miss a thing. That's what he's encouraging him here with. He wants a gospel-shaped church to honor good elders, to discipline bad elders, and to be careful when choosing new elders. He wants this to be a reality for us as a church, to let the gospel inform how we as saints respond to elders. And he finishes this section in chapter 6. Between servants and masters, This encouragement that servants to all of our masters should work well. There's a lot to say about, wait a second, does that mean Paul is encouraging slavery? We don't want to do that. We don't want to take our 21st century mindset and read that back into the text of the first century. That's anachronistic. It is not a helpful way to interpret God's word. The reality is slavery up until actually fairly recently, was a known reality for most civilization. And Paul was working within the context of what was known rather than trying to change the society he was in. The gospel's job is not to change slavery. The gospel's job is to change hearts, which may change slavery. (laughs) Do you get that though? But one has to come before the other. The gospel's job is not to end abortion. The gospel's job is to change hearts, which hopefully then gets rid of abortion. But do you see the order there? In whatever context the gospel finds itself, whatever social issues are prevalent in the day, the first priority of the gospel is to change hearts. Sinful rebels who've been cared and loved by a God who loves them and sent his son to die for them so they can have everlasting life. That's what he wants to remind us. So instead of taking our 21st century context and putting into the first, I think the best parallel here between servants and masters is those of us that work for bosses. Whether it be, again, in, in, in your own business or whether it be for someone else, whether you are working for a non-Christian or you're working for a Christian. And this is what he says in verse 2, those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Here's the temptation. You might think, well, my boss is a Christian. Ah, oh, I'm just going to take it easy. I'm just going to... We know each other. We do Bible study. So if I, if I get to work a little late on Friday, he'll be okay. No, no, Paul wants to disavow you of any notion of that. He wants to challenge you that if your boss is a Christian, you should be working that much harder for them. And if he's not, back to verse 1, don't do... Have you ever heard this term? Don't quiet quit. Have you heard this term recently? Quiet quitting is this idea that you go to work, but you just, I don't really like my boss. I don't really like my job, so I'm just going to put the bare minimum effort, which is a bit of a misnomer because you don't quit and you still get a paycheck. Don't quiet quit. Be a Christian who uses your work not just for the salary you get, not just for the support to your family and the community, 
Because as Paul says back in verse 1, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Don't make your God look bad. So work hard. What a great encouragement. Gospel-shaped church has saints who honor and serve their bosses well, in whatever context of bosses that may be. And this is exactly what we want for our church. The general encouragement of these verses is that we who are under leadership, whether it's the leadership of the church or under the leadership of your workplace, we should give thanks to those who lead. Sometimes it's a word of thanks. Sometimes it's a financial means of thanks. Sometimes it's working hard as a way of saying thanks. But whatever case it may be, it's an encouragement to give thanks to those who lead. I remember talking about this passage one time a number of years ago with, with a dear sister who was a little challenged, who was a little concerned about the thought, particularly of saying thanks and maybe even giving money to elders. Her argument was, they volunteered for this though. Why should we give them money when they volunteer? No one put a gun to their head. They knew what they were signing up for. Why should we give them money? <laughs> she was a mother. She had a number of kids. And I said, let me ask you this. Mother's Day is rolling around here soon. And you might be really excited about the thought of waking up and your kids making you breakfast or taking you out to lunch, bringing you flowers and sharing all kinds of love for you on Mother's Day. But what if your kids wake up on Mother's Day and say to you, Mom, we're done with the flowers. No breakfast in bed, no taking you out to dinner. Because, Mom, you know, you signed up for this thing called Mom. Nobody forced you to be a mom. No one put a gun to your head to be a mom. Mom, you should just do your job and be grateful. What if your kids never said thanks? You'd see her reaction. <laughs> of course you get the point, right? Moms and elders and bosses, yeah, they don't do it for the thanks. That's not why we lead. But those that they lead, may I encourage you, you should still give thanks. You should still show them love. Because if anyone should be thankful people, it should be us. When our great leader, when Jesus Christ himself, the one who has led us, has given us encouragement in so many ways, a gospel-shaped church serves our leader, Jesus, as he leads and serves his church. That's what we're going to do next year. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper as our means of saying thanks to Jesus for how he has served us. If anyone should be filled with thanksgiving, it's us. And our encouragement is to be a community, to be a gospel-shaped church that is filled with this thanksgiving. You know, that girl that my brother brought home that day, she eventually turned into his wife. My sister-in-law, in over 25 years of marriage, and you know what? She still doesn't call her Mrs. Matthew. She calls her something much more honorable. She calls her mom. Because you see, the relationship is still there. She still recognizes the honor that my mom deserves. But it's so much more than just a title. It's so much more than just some perfunctory sentence. There's a deep love between my sister-in-law and my mom. Yeah, she doesn't call her Mrs. Matthew, but she calls her something much more respectable. She calls her mom. This is what we're called to. To understand those who God has given to us to lead and not just to perfunctory do these things just to check off a box, but to show our love in real and tangible ways so that we too can be a church that is shaped by the gospel for our good and for His glory. Father, we come to You this morning and we continue to be amazed that You would serve us. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And that much more, we are thankful for that, Lord. 
And in your stead, you have called in this church men to lead, to be your under shepherds. You are the great shepherd. You are the only perfect shepherd that leads this church. But you, in your wisdom, have called other men, like Abe, like Sean, like Juan, and myself. And so many other men before that have been in the history of ACC and men that will come into the future of ACC. In your wisdom, you have called these men to lead and to serve. Thank you for them. Thank you for the many men who have served. And may we show, may we be people filled with thanksgiving, not because these men want it or are clamoring for it, but because they do so to honor and show their love for you and for the church. Thank you for those men. Thank you for our church. May we continue to be shaped by the gospel that has saved us and gives us hope. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.